written by first before I go to the details of the book that Perish the Silver was a man of the times and much beyond the times because the ideas that he expressed in what he was in what I will call Dialgo because it's a long title I'll read the title to you Dialgo entro un doutor em filosofia e um português da Índia na cidade de Lisboa sobre a constituição política do reino de Portugal suas vantagens e meios de mantê-la uh, What does this long title actually mean? Was a dialogue between uh, an intellectual in Portugal with a native Portuguese Indian on the constitution which was in force in Portugal, what were its merits and the system to maintain it. All this I all this figured in a in a discourse or in a dialogic log, logic form in this 66 page book. He himself said that it is a folieto. A folieto is actually a flyer or a pamphlet. I do not agree even with Bernard Perez Silva himself that a 66 page book could be called a flyer or a pamphlet. It was definitely a booklet. It had four main parts. Firstly, it the elements of the constitution, the components of the constitution. What were the powers? Executive, legislative, judicial, and one more power, moderating power. Four powers. We have three powers under our constitution. Four powers. Then another part of, of the first segment, first segment included a lot of civil and political rights like freedom of expression through writing, through the press. Then uh, life, uh, 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 security of life, right to property, right to education, and so many other civil and political and legal rights which you are echoed in our Indian constitution of today. Imagine those ideas of the 1820s and 1830s. And in this first segment, he also analyzes. He, he wants to, it's a, in, in a dialogue form after all, it's a discourse between a doctor and a doctor and an Indian, doctor of philosophy and an Indian. So he, he in his discourse, he not only tells what the constitution is about, he also tries to show that you know, he tries to distinguish between taking the, uh, using his arguments, he goes back to many absolute and liberal societies of the past to, uh, to his time and therefore clearly shows the difference between absolutism and constitutionalism. And I, I reiterate, imagine all such ideas expressed by one of our own, our own Bernard Parrish de Silva, whom we dismiss as BPS Club. The second part of his book is still more significant because he concentrates on Goa. After all, he has dedicated the book to the youth of Goa. The he, first and foremost, I have to tell you that he, was, he totally goes into words that despises the despotism 
of the Portuguese over the centuries and particularly in the overseas provinces and in Goa. He says Portugal sends the waste of its country to Goa and these people, this waste, this waste occupies high level positions, administrative, judicial, financial positions, totally immoral and corrupt. And wake up goons, he says, wake up goons. He says, you have to do something about it. And one of them is, he speaks about education. He says, Edu, you, wake up some of you who have, are educated, send your children to school, send them to Europe for, a high, for higher education. There, uh, these, there have been great men like Solon, Tales, Pythagoras, Orpheus, or Orpheus, all these men, they, all these people have gained such a lot with their travels. Send your children to Europe, Kumi Dadesh of Goa, subsidize at least 12 of them per year. He wanted to see that all Goans had basic education at least in Goa and some at least who through the Kumnidars to send them to Europe for higher education. But then only, he said, there'll be public speakers, there'll be public opinion, you can express yourself through the newspapers and you, and you will, even though you have so many doubts about the advantages and merits of the Constitution, you are sure, that, and, and he ascertains this, I'm sure that you will ever overcome all your problems. He, he was aware of the pre prejudices also in Goan society. The prejudices of, of uh, you could say, uh, caste, creed and race, which was there at that time. Very clearly he brings it out in his book. He, he asked the people of Goa to develop certain qualities which are necessary for, uh, uh, to, for, their, for their betterment, for their happiness. Virtues like courage, bravery, virtues like being hardworking, like, like uh, being people who would give more importance to who get their pleasures honestly through hard work. He believed in pleasures, but pleasures through hard work. My book is a transcription, a translation, and a dissection of Bernard Perez de Silva's Diago. And the last, a last, a one, a last two points I wish to make is that he tells them, you will unite, union, will union and union alone will bind together the social laces, the laces in society, union, be united, people with a common language, culture, come together, come together. The rich will join you, the poor also will join you, and, may, and it will, you will develop into a middle class. There will be some sort of a median. That is also what he tells. Have a sense of unity, have a sense of solidarity. And with this, with this he feels, with education, with having these qualities, with Going in for a movement, a movement for self-societal reform, for political reform, for the constitutional, for the constitution. With, with this he said, constitution is the only plank of your salvation. He told them, where he, he tells, he expresses so very clearly in his book, Diago. And the last part of his book, clearly 
the last part of his book clearly is about his dream. He has presented the, uh, the constitution. This is what I want for Goa. He has presented in his book a citizenry in Goa. This is the kind of Goan I want. Who will be, who will be brave, who will be courageous, who will express herself, who will, who will see to it that subjugation and suppression under the Portuguese will end. And that is only through the constitution. He has a dream. Let me tell you his dream. He expresses this in his discourse. He said, one night I had a dream. A dream that I was being carried uh, by a spirit over the Chandranath hill. Uttam, are you there? Yes, you're from there. Over the Chandranath hill. And I can see, especially in the new conquest areas, I can see so much of plants plantation when earlier it was desolation. I can see the people so busy in, in their work. Earlier they were in a state of inertia. I can see schools, schools for girls, boards, schools for girls, schools for boys. I can see in the streets, like the house of weaving, the house of spinning, and so forth. He, it was his dream, the dream, the dream for a better Goa, a dream for Goans to have happiness, but to have that happiness, not to dishonest ways. He was against salaried class, against it. Not true salaries, he said, because he knew that the higher posts were occupied by whom? By the Portuguese, not the salaried class of today. Please don't misunderstand me. He was against the salaried class of then. He said, hard work, industrious, industriousness only can bring you the true happiness and betterment. He, he clearly says, that liberty, f freedom will lead to happiness. He tells the people this. He tells them. You want, you think what you want and want what you think. You are the people who can choose good leaders. Isn't it an echo for us today? You are the people who can choose good leaders. You are the people who can make good laws. Because with our leaders, which we choose, we can have good laws. Let me tell you that. To me, I think I carried away, carry away two important things that I am proud of the fact that constitutionalism as expressed by Bernard Paris de Silva existed in Goa 200 years ago. Last year was a bicentenary year. 200 years ago, much before we got the Indian constitution. Proud that tiny Goa had it. Second, I'm proud of another matter. A great scholar, many of you might, must have read some of his works, but this is the work of 2012. Recovering Liberties, in his book, Recovering Liberties, Christopher Bailey has, has ranked the, the 66-page Dialgo, along with the works of Ram Mohan Roy. 
So this is about my first book. My second book is, the title itself is clear to you. It, it is about our land, Goa. It is an introduction, historical introduction to the land Goa, its people, its and its culture. It emphasizes on all aspects, polity, economy and society. It has 40 chapters and seven chapters dedicated to pre-Portuguese times or pre-colonial times where you had the formation of Gaunkaris, you had dynastic rule, some from far and some from close by like the Shalaras and the Kadambas and the imprint that all the dynasties left on Goa. And then we had the struggle between Vijayanagar and Bahamni over Goa. To me, the pre-Portuguese times has two takeaways. One, the Kankaris. Secondly, the imprint of dynastic rule. And thirdly, it brings out very clearly the maritime culture of Goa through its capitals, Chandrapur and Kopakapatna. The last four chapters are post-colonial. The pre-colonial and the post-colonial both were difficult to write. Pre-colonial because because there are no written records but inscriptions in a language alien to us. But we have some published works. Post-colonial because hardly anybody has worked on the post-colonial period. At the most they have touched upon on Bandotka. I'm, I'm talking about academic, pure academic work. So this, so in between is a period of the Portuguese presence. And I would like to divide this 450 year period into two parts, where the voice of the first 250 years, the voice of the people was slightly heard, but was subdued because of political, economic, and cultural imperialism, Christianization. And the second 200 years, you see the voice of the people. The voice of the people is stronger than the voice of the col colonials, colonizers. Voice of the people through revolts. Voice of the people through constitutionalism. Voice of the people through offshoots of constitutionalism. That is, uh, parties, political parties, elections. Can you imagine we had, we had political parties and elections in the 19th century? Did the mighty British India have it? What tiny Portuguese India had? Political parties, elections, all, and education and press, all offshoots of constitutionalism. We had the rise of intellectuals. We had Goan immigration in this, everything connected with the people. We had then a major part, the freedom movement. Freedom movement, we know, many of us know details about National Congress Goa or Azad Komantak Dal or Vimotran Samiti, all culminating in Operation Vijay. The, the use of, uh, you know, uh, uh, aggression or the military or the force by the Nehru government in, in, uh, in, in India, in the Union, because Nehru took long time to decide upon this. He was a man, he believed in non-violence. He was not in favor of using aggression.
careful. But there was so much of pressure from all sides, internationally, and finally came Operation Vijay, which freed Goa from the Portuguese yoke on the 19th of December, 1961. And lastly, I come to the just four chapters on post-colonial Goa. And therefore, I, it's my clarion call to anyone here to much more has to be done. Youngsters like Jan, we are, we are can, they, they, much more must be done of post-colonial times. Yet, I have highlight, I have some highlights. It, it, there are highlights. Opinion hole, poll was a great highlight. We never had opinion poll anywhere in India. The historic opinion poll in Goa in 1967. Then the Konkani movement, which was compelled to become violent. Goa is never known for violence. We'll protest. Activist Patricia Pinto is here. We'll protest, but we'll do it in a non-violent way. But the Kokani movement, I have, with my very eyes, have seen the violence. I'll just tell you on one of the days, my aunt, Laurita, is here, her mother, Lira, my mother's sister. And she turned up at my place from Bombay by steamer. And it was one of those days which we never stepped out of half our houses. And she wanted from our house to go to Lothari. My mother refused to allow me to accompany her. She told, if you want, you go alone. I'm not ready to sacrifice my only daughter. But one fine day, when my mother went to the market, I took her by bus, via Ponda. We got down there at the Bori Bridge, walked across, saw burning tires, violence with our own eyes for the Konkani movement in Salzit region particularly. And I just dropped her at her daughter's place and rushed home before my mother would, you know, uh, and when you know her as a, a person who would never ever spare a rod even if you're an adult. So, so, uh, well, uh, uh, this was such a significant movement and the movement for statehood. I've also highlighted three whom I consider, others may have a different opinion, through three important chief ministers. Naturally, our very first chief minister, uh, Dayanan Bandutkar, no easy task for, uh, for him because he was the uh, Chief Minister after the colonial period. Then I, I've also highlighted uh, Pratap Singh Rane's regime. And lastly, I ended with uh, Mr. Manohar Parikar's regime in 1920. These books would never have seen. First of all, I have to tell you, concise history particularly was in storage, cold storage, for 25 years. But it was Frederick Norona, Dr. Frederick Norona, Dr. Fatima Gracious, and Mrs. Maria Lilia de Souza, who said, no, no, no work should go to waste. Well, if you have it, now is the time to use it. Go ahead and publish it. And Frederick Norona published it along with the other work of the album. I thank him extremely for his, uh, you know, uh, his gesture. I also thank Irene Rocha for typesetting both the books, for the cover design of Concise uh, History of Goa, I thank Nadine Brazier, and for the cover book of Diago, Bina Naik. But, for each of these books, as I already told you for concise history, there were those propellers, those propellers. For concise history, 
Dr. Fatima Gracious, Dr. Frederick Norona, Mrs. Uh, Maria Lilia de Souza, prepare, prepared me to go ahead. Don't, no, 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 you should not take it to the morgue or it will land in, 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 in the cemetery. Nothing like that. And I, I couldn't believe when I took out my draft after 15 years that I had written 40 chapters. I just couldn't believe myself. So much, so deep down it was in my memory. So, so deep down. As, as for the other book, which I will say, Dial, I have to mention Professor Helder Gauch. I had presented a paper on it. He had invited me to Brazil. And it was he who initiated me into intellectual and literary history. I have to remember also Mrs. Maria Lilia de Souza because there was there is not a copy, original copy of Diago in Goa, please. Not an original copy. I worked with a Xerox copy from this very institution. From this very institution. So I have to thank this institution along with the former librarian of this institution, Maria Lilia de Souza, who told me about the same. She says, no, there's a copy of, and, and that's it. And thirdly, and, and I think very significantly, Mr. Antonio Manuel Pereira Benaudi, who is who's a great, great admirer of BPS, and who has been over the years pushing me with, uh, with, uh, with uh, going ahead, to go ahead and write about him. I owe this also to him. With, the, with these words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I end this such a long discourse, a long uh, talk, and uh, and I and, ha, I, and I ask you to uh, have, uh, thank you to uh, having, for having patience for having heard me out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Celso Pinto, for the awareness provided through your books. We now come to the most awaited part of the function, release of the books. Requesting guests on the days to kindly rise is the author's desire to have Mr. Antonio Manuel Pereira and Dr. Frederick Norona, the publisher of the book, to come on the days and be part of the release.
It's my pleasure to invite the chief guest to address the gathering. Thank you, Father Malcolm, for the introduction to the program. And thank you so much, Dr. Celsa Pinto, for that very lucid and wide-ranging introduction to both your wonderful books. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three things that I am very fond of, that I love passionately. One is history, one is political thought, and one is Goa. And so when Dr. Celsa Pinto asked me to preside over this evening's function for the release of these two books, I accepted with alacrity. This was a great privilege because these three books combine in them all these three things. Goa, history, political thought. <coughs> Goa has produced <coughs> some brilliant minds, many of them Dr. Celsa Pinto mentioned, but some of those minds really require attention at the international level, like Abad Faria the great psychiatrist, psychologist, scientist, who even had a role in the French Revolution. Sigmund Freud drew on his writings. And another such is Bernard Perez de Silva. Yet, when we study the development of Indian thought, we, 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 have a, we had a paper in college called Indian Renaissance, beginning with Raja Ram Mohan Roy, and then going through so many thinkers, there was no mention of Bernard Perish de Silva. And there is a reason. I mean, I don't think the omission is deliberate. The reason really is the language barrier. We have all become an Anglophone society. The rest of India was always attached to English and now even Goa has become attached to English. And many of these people, because they were educated in Portuguese, just like people were educated in English in the rest of India because of British colonialism, these Goans were educated in Portuguese in Goa and they wrote in Portuguese naturally. But the language barrier kept their works away from the rest of India. And so when the history of India is written and the history of political thought and the Indian Renaissance, these names just get left out, not because of any deliberate policy, but because people didn't even have access to them. Dr. Celsa Pinto mentions the BPS club in Margaon. And to my horror, now I'm talking even go unseen sometimes when I asked somebody recently, there was a function there and I was going and I was asked, I asked somebody, said, what do you think BPS, BPS club is? Someone said probably Bharat Petroleum Society, something like that. <laughs> so uh, the great value of uh, Dr. Celsa Pinto's work is that she has taken a seminal book and she said she worked from a cyclostyle copy because the book was written almost 200 years ago, 188 years ago. She worked from that. She's reproduced it in Portuguese and she has translated it. And she's put both there and that, there's a great advantage because you see when, when you translate and as she was, when we were talking, she said some words were not very clear, even the cyclo styling. So she chose a certain translation Perhaps there may be people who may feel, no, it should not have been translated like this. So she has given both versions, the Portuguese version and the English version of her translation. So you can compare it 
And if anybody knows uh, both languages, they can go back to the original and see if what she has translated is, uh, according to them, right or wrong. So she's put both versions there, and not just a translation. She has put all this into context, both a historical context and a philosophical context. She has discussed this book, she has analyzed it, she has evaluated it, all these ideas. And I think that is a huge contribution to not just the history of Goa and the contribution of Goa, but it is a contribution to the national history. There is so much talk about rewriting history. And I think when history is being rewritten, Contributions of people like Bernard Perez de Silva need to be uh, brought in to the national discourse. Now, Celsa has told you in a great deal of detail about the book. I won't talk, therefore, about all that is in it, in it. But I just want to mention two or three things that struck me. One is, of course, the dialogue format of the dialogue. You know, it's in the old Plato's dialogues and then Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theology, written in the form of a dialogue, question, answer, question, answer, makes it simple, makes it easy to understand. Otherwise, there's one way of writing where the author would just say, you know, this, 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 this. But when there is a dialogue, there is a kind of discussion bringing in various points of view. Why is this? Is it not like that? Should it not have been like that? Why do you say this? And this whole thing in 66 odd pages comes out as a dialogue. The format is brilliant. See, this is not being written today as many times Dr. Celsa Pinto has said. 200 years ago, this is being written. The second, the dedication of this book struck me. It is dedicated by Bernard Perish de Silva, to the youth of India. Dedicated to the youth of India. I know there are some people who say actually he means Goa because the Portuguese referred to as their possession over here, Goa, the Estado de India. So it is, it is Goa that he is referring to. But I, I, I have a slightly different take on this. I see in his writing of the book when I, when I went through it, he is actually seeking a much wider audience than only Goa. Yes, Goa is the focus of this book, but he is seeking a wider audience because he has a dig at the British also. He says, I, I, I am here also referring, he doesn't mention them by name, but that power that rules the rest of Hindustan and which purports to be uh, devoted to uh, political constitutionalism and liberalism. And if that is true, why do they not bring those benefits to the tens of millions of people in Hindustan? He says that in his book. So you can see here, he's digging at the British and he, his audience is yes, Goa, but his audience is also the rest of India. So he is talking about constitutionalism to come in India 100 years before it happened. 50 years before the Indian National Congress was formed, which was formed in 1884. He is writing this in 1832. Asking for constitutionalism even in India. Telling the British you ought to be doing this. Now these are huge things. They are important things. Then. Yes, one will imagine that he was just, you know, a kind of tattoo of the Portuguese government. That was not so. He is very much fascinated with the idea of political uh, uh, constitutionalism because of the revolution in Portugal in 1820 and the constitution of 1822 and all the difficulties that followed that. He's writing in 1832, 10 years. In between, the constitution was abrogated, then it came back again. But he is also critical of colonialism. He says quite candidly, the, the, the urge to conquest is, is uh, governed by the lust for gold. He says, 
uh, uh, the, the colonial powers trampled on the sacred laws of nature and he says they subjugated unarmed people in the new world and the old world so he's even referring to Brazil, South America the Spanish conquests over there and of course colonialism in Asia now all this is part of Bernard Perez de Silva's book and really I thought that is something which, which, which is important not only that he is an admirer of the constitution but he is already calling for reform in the constitution he defends bicameralism that is two houses uh, of parliament like we have in India Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha they have in England House of Lords, House of Commons so even this constitution has a bicameral constitution someone says why then he gives reasons in the dialogue of why bicameralism is good but he also says this business of having only noblemen and church dignitaries, the bishops and the cardinals, automatically as members of the upper house, is wrong. Because he says nobles are always the enemy of liberty. And the upper house also needs to be reformed. So the constitution is barely started. He is defending it, defending the idea of political liberalism, of constitutional liberalism. But he is also pointing out the flaws and asking for reform. So this is something which is extremely critical, extremely important. And what happens to Bernard Perez de Silva after this? I, uh, I am grateful to Dr. Celsa Pinto for asking me uh, to be at this function because also of a personal reason. There is a personal connect to this whole thing. Uh, which is dear to my heart and therefore I am so happy about it. This Bernard Perez de Silva wrote this book in 1832. He actually was elected by virtue of this constitution. He was elected as a member of parliament uh, from Goa. Three, three Goans were elected members of parliament because this constitution actually declared all the Portuguese possessions as equal parts of the Portuguese nation and all of them had the right to send members of parliament to the Portuguese Cortes. So he was elected uh, as one of the three and they left for Lisbon to participate in the, in, 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 in the, in the parliament and then I think in Mozambique they stopped, their boat stopped and they were delayed and by the time they, re they were in fact held prisoner uh, not really prisoner but they were sort of delayed on purpose and by the time they reached Lisbon Parliament had been dissolved because there was all sorts of things going on and the constitution was set aside. So anyway, by 1927 again the constitution came into being. He stood for elections again in Goa. Again he won the elections. And then he went to Portugal to participate. There were again certain problems. He went from there to England and from England to Brazil. And then he was in Brazil for a few years. That is why this book of his in 1832 was published in Brazil. But what happened is from Brazil, things began changing in Portugal. He went back to Lisbon. He was able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, his, his ideas of, of constitutionalism then began to get accepted because Brazil uh, declared its independence. The son of the king was declared emperor over there. The king returned, the Portuguese court returned to Lisbon. And he was able to, you know, people began realizing that this man has got a brilliant mind and he was appointed the first civil governor of Goa. The first Goan civil governor of Goa, not the first governor of Goa, the first Goan civil governor of Goa in 1834. Up to 1834, Goa had only white governors. He was the first native Goan, born in Neora. He was appointed and his nominee, his appointment was declared by the court in Lisbon in, in May 1834 and then he set out by whatever boat was available this that everything he reached Goa in January uh, 1835 to be sworn in now there was a huge opposition to this among the the, the European uh, the European officers who were in Goa and the military though as civil governor he didn't have power over the military 
there was uh, the power of the, of the military was kept separate. But still they couldn't, the governor is governor. They couldn't imagine why a non-white should be uh, over all their heads. But of course there was huge support among the Goan population to, for him. And he took his oath of office uh, on the 14th of January, 1835. I mean, these are dates that are so important in Goan history. The first native Goan to be governor of Goa and governor with real powers. The powers today, you would say, of the chief minister and the governor and everybody all rolled into one. And what did he do? He immediately set about reform. All his ideas that Celsus spoke about, his brilliant ideas and this, what he had written in his book and things he started reforming. He made sweeping changes in the finance department, sweeping changes in the judicial department. He abolished the taxes on the communidades because being a Goan, he knew the value of the communidades. And he said the communidades should actually fund education, should fund people from the villages to go for higher education. What Celsus had said, he was wanting the young people to go abroad and take advantage of the universities in Europe. He said, let the communidades fund them. But there was a heavy tax on communidades. He abolished that tax. He reformed the whole council of the city of Panjim. He appointed Goans over there to rule, to, to, to manage the city corporation. He passed rules clipping the wings of the church in the judicial area. All these reforms, how long do you think he was governor? How many years or how many months? He was governor for 17 days. 17 days he did all this. From day go he began. On the 18th day, on the 1st of February, he took his oath on the 14th of, uh, of, uh, of January. On the 1st of February, he was overthrown by the military because the military couldn't stand it. So the military, uh, they deposed him and took him prisoner. And then of course protests broke out all over Goa. Uh, 10th of February there were, there, there, were, there were demonstrations all over the place and the government, uh, the military really, the government, because he was the governor, he was the legitimate governor. Lisbon hadn't changed its orders, but the military went and uh, 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 you know, crushed those revolts. And then now, here I come to what the personal point is. On the 3rd of March, on the 3rd of March, a military revolt broke out. An army revolt broke out. And Goan officers of the army said, what is this nonsense? Maybe he is not, the, he's not in charge of the army, but he is a civil governor and we have to respect that. So there were a group of Goan officers who were led by a captain in the army, Marian de Rocha from Aldona. Six of them got together a lot of people and they, they began the revolt in Bardesh and they took over the fort of Tirakol. On the 3rd of March, they pulled down the governor's standard. At that time, the Portuguese flag wasn't what it was like now and each governor had their own standards. So it was the governor's standard. They pulled it down. And they held in revolt the fort of Tirakol for almost three months. The whole might of the Portuguese army in Goa tried to get Tirakol, but they couldn't defeat these mutineers, revolutionaries. This again, the, the mutiny in India took place in 1857. This is happening in 1835 in Goa. The revolt of the military. And the Portuguese army could not uh, defeat them. They were, they were, the, the contingent was led by a colonel, uh, Samta Costa, who was a, a Portuguese man from Mabsa. And uh, he was known as uh, Mata Tigris because he had shot uh, some tigers, I suppose, in the forest. That again proves that there were tigers in Goa even then. Now people are saying tigers are straying into Goa. They're not stray. They are indigenous to Goa. So then Mata Tigris finally uh, decided in May to do, they of course cut off all supplies to Tirakol, water, food, everything. 
and then they, 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 they kind of tricked the revolutionaries into giving up, saying that they had arrived at an understanding with Bernard Perez de Silva and actually Bernard Perez de Silva had actually gone into exile to Bombay. But they, there was no WhatsApp no, in those days. So how are they going to know in Piracol that this is not true? And they said, no, we've arrived at understanding and uh, you know, even your revolt, or solemn oaths that revolt, all that would be forgiven. So these people opened the gates of Tirakal and they came down and they were promptly set upon and six of them were beheaded. Marian Rocha and his five colleagues were officers. Marian Rocha himself was a captain and there were not so many officers uh, in the Portuguese army who were Goans. Goans were mostly taken and the soldiers but there were a few and they were beheaded. And it was not just a beheading. They wanted to teach a lesson. So the, the heads of these people were put on pikes. And Mata Tigrish ordered that they should all go to each of these people's native villages and plant their heads there in the middle of the village square or in front of their houses as a warning. And Marian Rosh's head was taken on a pike and planted in front of his house in Kitula. And until it, you know. So that was, and, and, and the personal thing is that Marian Rosh is my great, great, great grandfather. <laughs> so that is the connection. And in his writings, the story really is in his writings, Marian Rosh said that what, uh, 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 what um, uh, motivated him was that he had read this book of Bernard Perish de Silva. It was not some personal loyalty to BPS himself, but he said that he had read this book. And it is the book, the writings of BPS that had motivated him and his fellow officers to even fight to the death. So, this is, that, I mean, that is why I, I, I feel so privileged today to be here at the release of this book. And coming to Salsa's second book, she has told you all about it. There is always a dearth. It's not that there are not history books, there are history books. But the more people that write, that put together, that interpret things, the better. And Selsa has written this in a concise way, so even an average reader, she's not stinted on scholarship. Scholarship is there, but it is for an average reader to read this history of Goa. And what is most fascinating is what she told you, she has attempted to write even the post-liberation part with four chapters, bringing it right up to Parikar or no also deal with Parikar. So that, that is very difficult to write. You see, contemporary history is very difficult to write. Old history is much easier, but contemporary history is not easy. But Selsa has done that and that lays the basis. It's not the last word. No historian ever claims that what they write is the last word. But it forms the basis for other people to take up research, forms the basis for other people to take it forward. And I'm sure that is what will happen. These two books, not meant only for scholars. Yes, meant for scholars, but meant for the general public. And I'm so happy today to be presiding over this function where these two wonderful books have been brought. I thank Dr. Selsa Pinto for inviting me. I thank Dr. Frederick Narona for publishing these books. Thank you and I hope all of you enjoy the books. Good evening. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking address. I'm pleased to call now Dr. Selsa Pinto to propose a vote of thanks. February function here in Xavier Center is coming to an end. And it should not end without words of appreciation.
the very first person to thank is our chief guest, Mr. Anthony Desa. I never realized that he was a man of history. You took a risk of inviting me even without that. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, sir, that whatever you said of Bernard Perish de Silva after 1832, whatever you mentioned, is to be part, including Russia's role, is to be part of the life and times of Bernard Perish de Silva. I have to thank you in a very special way. This particular chief guest is a rare one. I will tell you why. I, in my lifetime, had to contact, I am sure, more than 100, uh, you know, personalities to be chief guests. But he's the only one who, he says, any day, any time, but no, but on the days when I am in Goa. So, I was supposed to hold it in January. He gave me his itinerary for the whole of January. And now we are towards the second half of February. He even gave me that. He just is a very special chief guest. I am very proud to say that and deeply also honored to say that he is my fellow diaspora. We are on the diaspora group and I, I am grateful. He hardly knew me except through the book. But he came and collected the works from my home. Which chief guest does that? So this is the man, Mr. Anthony Dessa, IAS, retired Chief Secretary to the Government of Madhya Pradesh. <laughs> After the guest comes the host. Host is none other than the Xavier Center. I, 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 I remember without hesitation, Dr. Anthony De Silva said he would host this function. I am extremely grateful to all efforts made by Father Malcolm Barreto to make this function meaningful here in this institution. Earlier I had my functions elsewhere. God Chamber of Commerce, Institute Menezes Brigantza, and it was my desire that one day to have it in, in my alma, alma mater. For my PhD studies, this was my place. And I'm very proud to have held this function here. Thank you very much, Father Malcolm. And <laughs> Dr. Frederick Norona, please pay attention. My thanks go out to you, the publisher and owner of Goa 1556. Both the books came to light. First book with a few hiccups, but second book came galloping. So whatever it may be, with hiccups so, uh, or in a galloping way, I have, uh, I owe much to Dr. Frederick Norona. And he's doing such wonderful work, I have to say, for Goa. Goa needs more people li like him, not only for publication, He's such a great networker. You have no idea that he is the creator and originator of maybe 15 
WhatsApp groups on different, different teams, such as he, such as a, a person called Dr. Frederick Norona. I have to thank Mrs. Minion Vishkita, my godchild, the compare of today's function, I had given a very short notice. But you did an excellent job, Minion. And uh, I'm very proud to have you to be the compare, the former bank manager of IDBI. Very special work towards this function have also been re rendered by my friend and neighbor, Goretti Pereira, and Fatshi's family also. And similarly, a family, friend, brother, Uttam Rao Desai, thank you very much for the help you have given. I can't forget the press. The fourth estate is a very powerful estate. We cannot do without you. And you made it to this function. Very, very grateful to you. No function is possible without an audience. And in this audience, we have people of all, uh, you, you would say, all categories. I have members of the family. I have my classmates of Lutz Convent, high school, Saniga, former, former classmates. I have representatives. Yes, Bharati Falari, who represents the education department. Maybe Ram, Ram Dio was more important. And so the others could not turn up. After all, they have the whip to, to, to see to it that that function is a success. But I know that they are in spirit with me. I will not mention names, but I know many in the education department are in spirit with me. Thank you also, Dr. Pandurang Paldesai, the new director of Konkani Kendra. We have also uh, scholars, scholars and lovers of history. All those who felt that, it, that maybe uh, their uh, presence will give me some happiness. Thank you for that, for making me happy. I must thank one more and one more. Let me say entity. I have to thank the Lord. More importantly than anyone else. Because time and again, he reminds me that whatever may be the problems and obstacles that you are facing, where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, a big thank you to everyone present here. Please feel free to have a glimpse of the author's two books which are on display and sale on the rear side of the hall. Thank you. Thank you.